That's what it is. It does. Have you guys ever been truly a part? I had to reshape my identity. I had to become like this individual. There's a renaissance in black art. Is that true? I feel like the studio system, unfortunately, has this sort of myopic perception of black artists. So they typically put us into a box. Does anybody else know about me? No one knows your identity. Are you sure? Why is this story not more widely known? Why didn't we learn this during elementary school? Why didn't we just gloss over it? Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. Got a wonderful show today. First, the Lucas Brothers. Now they blew up in comedy, funny stand-up comedians who now are becoming writers of great films. Judas and the Black Messiah, big time films. Gonna love it. Coming up, we're honoring Black History Month with another one of these special woke history segments where we bring you those really delicious, important moments in black history that sometimes have been hidden, obscured, ignored. Not anymore. We're doing it in concert with a conversation with Karamo. He stops by, it's gonna be really good. Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey guys. Hey, hey, what's up? What's up, brother? I always wanted a twin brother. How good is it? Is it as good as advertising? It's just fun, man. You got your best friend with you, and you, yeah. if I start to stumble, he just picks me up. Yeah, it's like you, you, I always have a, a, a hype man with him. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I, I never feel like I'm, 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 I'm alone in this world. You know, we grew up in this, a, a tough living situation. Our father went to prison when we were six, so we had a lot of early childhood trauma. And you know, I, I never thought about getting therapy until I got, you know, got a little bit older. But before that. It was my brother who I leaned on for, right. for support, who, who I leaned on to get me to the next day. And I, I honestly don't think I would be where I am now if I didn't have a twin brother. Kenny and Keith Lucas are identical twin comedians, actors, writers, and producers born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. On their way to both becoming lawyers, they simultaneously dropped out to pursue stand-up comedy full-time. Their comedy career took off after their late-night debut on Jimmy Fallon back in 2012. Since then, the duo has appeared in numerous films, shows, and stand-up specials. Yang, what's up? Hey, what's going on? Keith Yang. What's up? What's going on, man? Did you say the Yangs? Yeah, Dad's Chinese, man. My mom's not Chinese. She's black. Oh, She's okay. like real black. Like Wesley Snipes black. Exactly. Now they're taking their combined talents to co-writing and co-producing Judas and the Black Messiah, a biopic of the black activist Fred Hampton. Do you guys ever have a moment where you guys, for whatever reason, went your own way or, or tried to go your own way? Or have you guys been a true yeah. unit? Because like the... Uh, the Morris brothers, uh, if you're basketball fans, the Morris brothers, they actually couldn't afford to play on different pro teams at one point. That they, mm-hmm. having spent so much time, literally the two teams decided, I'll give up one of my men so that those brothers can play together. Have you guys ever been truly wow. a part or not really? We have. Um, we, we separated a bit when we went to different law schools. Oh, right, so right, I, right. I went to Duke Law. He went to NYU Law, right. so for almost three years, we were living separate, separately. Right. And it was probably the toughest three years of my life, without a doubt. I had to reshape my identity. Mm-hmm. I had to become like this individual, and I just, I, I have no clue how to be. Yeah, and I, I never, I, I, I didn't realize that I was taking my brother for granted. You know, when he was gone, I forgot how much I leaned on him just for like emotional support. So like when we, when we were in college, we studied philosophy together and we, you know, we studied together. And anytime I had problems, I went to him. Mm-hmm. But at law school, it was like, you know, law school is even more vigorous than philosophy. Mm-hmm. And to not have his emotional and intellectual support just made it, made it even more difficult. It was, it was a huge yeah. challenge. You made me smile as soon as I saw Newark is for artists. I almost thought you said Newark <laughs> is for tourists, which was really going to make me smile. <laughs> that That's actually kind of funny. Newark is for tourists. It's so <laughs> ironic. It's really, I mean, now it is, but historically it's not. Yeah, yeah. You know, Newark is a, it's a special place. I mean, I think the narrative about it sort of gets, gets twisted a bit, but... I think a lot of people fail to recognize that Newark has produced a lot of talent. Right. Uh, you know, the founder of the Black Arts Movement is from Newark. Right. You know what I mean? You know, we were one of the first cities to have a black mayor, to have black black council people, mm-hmm. black leadership. In, like we grew up with black leadership. Right. So, does Newark feel like one of those places that that is on the move and has a chance to to evolve and grow? With you know, with Cory Booker, with uh, just the way we're situated from a. a a geographical standpoint, being so close to North, I mean, New York and Philly, 
I feel like we're uniquely situated to have a renaissance. In fact, I think that we are, you know, currently in that the early stages of a renaissance. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, Mayor Ross Baraka, he's been a champion of the city. Uh, I think he's built on what Corey did. Uh, but, you know, obviously his roots are Newark and he's, he's still spreading the message of his father. I think that, you know, we're seeing a, a renaissance in black art in general. So that you, you're going to talk about Newark. Right. You can't talk about black art, not talk about Newark. So right. I, I think you're right. I think we're uniquely positioned to, to, to take ourselves to the next level. And I think as more artists continue to grow and tell the fuller story about Newark, right. we're, we're going to see a more complete picture. And it's been a ton of investment. I love what you just said, that there's a renaissance in black art. And and I think you're right. I, I haven't put those words to it. And maybe you're more in artistic circles. So maybe that's a, that's something you, maybe you've been talking about for a while. But as I hear you say that, as I think about your partner, uh, Ryan Coogler, as I think about uh, Issa Rae, as I think about um, uh, Ava and what she's doing at Array, I, I put right. Isabel Wilkerson in there. I put, you know, Black Panther in there. I'm putting all that in there yeah. that there does feel like there's something rich and, and new. Is that true on the ground for people who are writing, doing comedy, doing dramas, uh, doing animation, uh, producing film? It, yeah. it does feel I, different? I, yeah, I think, you've, uh, I think you, you, you covered it pretty well. I think what's happened is you have the internet, you have streaming, and I think it's freed African-American artists from the dictates and the commands of the studio system. I still, I mean, there's still a partnership between black artists and the studio system, but I feel like streaming has given us, you know, more opportunities to really like create authentically black art that's not, un that's not un unencumbered by, you know, ridiculous dictates like we have to, you know, sell it overseas or we have to, you gotta have certain stars in the film so, so that it'll make money. Like, I feel like the studio system, unfortunately, has this sort of myopic perception of uh, black artists. And so they typically put us into a box, it be it comedy, be it drama. If you look at the comedies that come from the studio system, they're usually not, you know, nuanced. They're not nuanced. You know, they tend to be a little bit more formulaic and drag and sort of, you know, just awful. You ready? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <sighs> Very good. And one more for good luck. Uh-oh. You know what the worst thing about work is? Co-workers. Mm -hmm. It's terrible, right? Because they always complain about the job. Yeah, yeah, we were working on this show, mm -hmm. and we were writing, and uh, we had a 15-hour day. And one of the writers lost his mind. He was like, yo, man, they're working us like slaves, man. They're working us like slaves, yo. We were like, nah. <laughs> This ain't nothing like slavery, man, right? Man. We spent the last 15 hours debating whether or not Steve Harvey's mustache is real. I mean, <laughs> if that was slavery, it'd be dope. Yeah. How did you guys decide to leave, you know, successful law school experiences, NYU, Duke, premium law schools, graduating with honors to try your hand at comedy and other things? Was that always in the cards? Well, my first year of law school, I, I think I sort of, I, I instantly knew that it wasn't a profession for me. I always had that creative impulse. Like I, I always had this, I, I wanted to see what I could do as a creator, as someone who, uh, you know, thought about uh, creating worlds and filmmaking and writing scripts and telling stories. There was always this impulse and, uh, you know, I had to scratch it. And my experience was actually kind of radically different from my brother. Like I enjoy law school. I, I enjoyed it as much as a person can enjoy it. And then, you know, the, the, the job market crashed right? and people weren't getting the law job that they were, thought they were going to get. Right? And uh, my third year, I was just like deeply, deeply depressed. And then he called me up and said like, let's do stand up. And I thought he was crazy. And I was like, I'm not a stand up comedian. The long term goal was filming. For I, sure. I, I, you know, but you presented it first as stand up. Right, so right. I was just like, this, this guy's crazy. And then he sent me a video of him on stage. And I was like, he's terrible. But <laughs> but it's like, it was it was weird to see him on stage. And I was like, oh, that's kind of, it's, it was just like, it kind of like made me like happy just to see him doing it. Right, right. And uh, that's when we uh, came back to Jersey and we did stand up together for the first time. And we sucked. Right. Right, right. It was like, I felt an instant connection to it. And I was like, I love, I love this way more than I've, I've ever thought I loved the law. And I was like, that's when I was like, I gotta do it. I have to try stand up. Right. So I quit uh, a, a week later. 
Now, what did you love about it? Because I've heard different comedians talk about what they enjoy. What did you love about it? It's, it's a rush. Right. You're like, you, you go on, you're, you're afraid to step on stage. But once you step on stage and put the mic to your mouth and you see people looking at you and the lights are blaring on your face and it's just a rush, man. The Black Panthers are the single greatest threat to our national security. Our counterintelligence program must prevent the rise of a black messiah. Hey, tell me about the uh, the Fred Hampton movie. I was so glad to see that you did it. I love how you've yeah. uh, cast it. I know you worked with good people on it. How did you get involved in it? How did you help put this together? Yeah, man, the cast is electric and props to everyone who worked on the film. We, uh, we actually, we came across uh, Fred's story while we were in college, actually, uh, the sophomore year. Fred Hampton was a black activist in Chicago, the chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party dedicated to bringing about social change. In 1967, the FBI identified him as a radical threat and he was shot and killed in his bed, a death that most called an assassination. We're taking this African-American studies course, Professor Dr. Dr. Fisher, Dr. Fisher, big up to Fisher. And he, uh, we were covering Reconstruction up until the 1970s. And so we, we did this chapter on the Black Panthers and they talked about the state sanctioned assassination of Hampton. We'd never heard of him right, until college. I was like, Who, why is this story not more widely known? Why didn't we learn this during elementary school? Why, we, why didn't we just gloss over it? Like, and so that always struck us as odd. So once we decided to get into uh, entertainment, our goal was like, we gotta get a Fred Hampton film made. I don't know when we're gonna do it, how we're gonna do it, but as soon as we start getting a little bit more buzz as comedians and actors and stuff like that, we're gonna try to you know, transition and write this story and get it done. We read The Assassination of Fred Hampton, we read Black Against Empire, we were watching all of the speeches. Right, we, right. You know, we just tried to like really immerse ourselves into to the, the life story of Fred Hampton, who he was right. and what he stood for, his message. We don't think you fight five with five bits, we think you fight five with water bits. We gonna fight racism, not racism, but we gonna fight with solidarity. And then we came across this transcript of the Eyes on the Prize interview in 1980s, I think PBS, and it was about William O'Neill. He was doing this interview about it, and he was pretty much walking us through his time as a Panther in the late 60s. And we were like, oh, this is this is the film right here. We, I, it just felt so we saw, we saw it immediately. We were like, wait, this is this is a crime thriller. We have this informant who, who infiltrated the Black Panthers uh, and took down one of the greatest people of all time. Like that to us would make a perfect film. Right. And so we started constructing the story around William O'Neill infiltrating uh, the Black Panthers. And it's, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's a movie about a revolutionary socialist, so, uh, a Black revolutionary so being being produced by Warner Brothers. Like it's everything we could have hoped for. Everything we could hope for. people some advice because you guys know that dreaming fearlessly is not an easy thing to do for any of us. And, and even if you start to go down that road where you do dream fearlessly, actually bringing it alive can be heartbreaking, it can be difficult, it can be interrupted. Um, what's the best advice you've either gotten or given to someone about how to dream fearlessly and bring those dreams alive? This sounds almost cliche and, and I, I hate to say it, but I think the, the best advice I can give to anyone who wants to dream seriously is stay persistent. Uh, believe in your, your instincts and, and believe in yourself because no one's gonna believe in you. No, no, no studio, no, I mean, it, the institution's not gonna believe in you until you prove yourself. But in order to prove yourself, you have to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't have, you can have some doubts, that's reasonable, but like, don't let them overwhelm you. Don't, and, and you know, be prepared to, to, to I don't wanna say fail, but be prepared to not always it's not going to always go to where you want it to go. There are going to be obstacles. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be moments where you feel you're at your lowest. But like if you just, as Kenny said, stay persistent and, and, and just don't give up on yourself. Right. Anything is possible. Like we're from North New Jersey. Our father went to prison when we were six. We grew up poor. Mm -hmm. We had nothing growing. I mean, we had a family and we had some stuff, but you know, we grew up at the as, at the lower end of, uh, in class, and we made it to where we made it because we, we believed in ourselves. And we worked our asses off. So 
you got to work hard, but in it, but you got to have faith in yourself as well. And you right. know, if you have faith in the good Lord, that, that that helps too. Faith in God helps as well. Yeah, and you know, he, our faith in God carried us further than anything. Because right. even when you give up, you know, there's someone watching over you, and uh, it's, it's helped us tremendously. So, you know, it might be too spiritual for some folks, but it's it's been it's been a, a good guiding light for us. Uh, you mind if we do something I, I call rapid fire, where I want to hit you with a couple things and then uh, then have you come back yeah, at me? Yeah, do it. Okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, your favorite film of all time? The Godfather. The, the Big Lebowski. Favorite TV series of all time from each of you? Whew. Breaking Bad. Mm, Seinfeld. Interesting. Okay, I'm liking. Again, we got a little bit of difference. That's good. I'm, I'm going to take them both. Um, if you could meet anyone for dinner, alive, dead, you name it, who would you be excited about meeting? Martin Luther King Jr. Without a doubt. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with Fred Hampton. I'm gonna go with, I would love to talk to Fred. I would love to, I, he's such a, he, he just, I, I love his optimism. Uh, guys, they're gonna make me let you go, but I hope um, if you have time, I hope you'll come back in the future. I so appreciate you uh, stopping by. Yeah. Of course, this is awesome, man. Thank you, man. Thank, Thank you so much. It was a privilege and an honor. Hey, that was the Lucas Brothers. I really hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. Just good people. Love seeing the two of them together. Love seeing them support each other. Love their kind of friendship set that it seems like they're building out. I hope they help drive a lot of our art and a lot of our thinking for a long time to come. And the next time a friend comes up to you and says they're majoring in philosophy, don't dismiss it right away. Good things can come from that. All right, check out their new movie, Judas and the Black Messiah. Now, we're gonna turn from the Black Messiah to some more Black history. Now, Karamo is an actor, reality star, author, just a terrific all-around guy. He's here to share with us all a very special moment in the history of Black people. We're calling this segment Woke History, and I hope you enjoy it. Who do you want to tell me about today? Joseph Winters. Most people don't know that Joseph Winters actually created the patent and invented the fire escape lap. Now, this seems something like we all take for granted every day, and I just thought that is something that needs to be highlighted more. Now, the other thing I think I heard about him that intrigued me as well is that he was part of the Underground Railroad. He was, you know? And when you're talking about Joseph, yes, he was part of the Underground Railroad, which I just think is exceptional, that he is literally one of those individuals who's like, yes, let's figure out how to protect other Black people, get them to safety, get them to, by risking his own life. But then he created something that was saving so many lives. It's just a parallel. He just was always making sure that people were safe. I think it's great. Hey, that was our Woke History segment. I really hope you enjoyed it, found it valuable. Big thanks to Karamo. Really always appreciate him stopping by. Thank you for stopping by. Be sure to enjoy our podcast if you haven't already. Consider subscribing and definitely tell a friend. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.